literally just posted um, a video about this subject and somebody has um, uh, contacted me to say that in fact uh, it's not just GQ that um, did a did an article about the Audible podcast Edge of Reality. Also, the Financial Times did it, and more than that, the photograph they used was exactly the photograph that I posted on my earlier post. And I've now looked at the Financial Times article, and there's a wonderful little paragraph at the end where I get quoted, and I'm going to read it to you because I think it sums up a great deal. It talks about how uh, Jacques Peretti, uh, the interviewer, um, discusses so many, so much of the background and the rise of reality TV and how so much of it was predicated on those malicious um, uh, experiments conducted in America, the Milford and the Stanford University experiments. And, uh, and, and in fact, I've written about that and I think I've talked about that on here. But, um, uh, but Peretti also... Uh, talk to me about NDAs, about my experience, how uh, how how I didn't apply to be on this show. I I was headhunted and I knew nothing about reality TV. So in a way, I was an ideal candidate. I was the I was the candidate who felt comfortable in front of a camera and had no idea what I was in for. Um, and I didn't mind really. I was quite happy uh, with the filming. What I wasn't expecting and what I certainly didn't anticipate was the level of manipulation and the nastiness that occurred after the filming and after the show was over. I simply did not expect to have to sustain that level of unpleasantness for so long and that level of deceit for so long. Um, and it had a huge effect on me, so huge, I, th I would personally um, say that it uh, contributed in no small part to the cancer that I suffered. Um, so I think it had a life changing and a life-threatening um, force. I'm going to read this final paragraph because it's, um, it's, it, 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 it's quite interesting. So um, it says here, uh, Peretti looks at the roles of producers who often work punishingly long hours on low pay um, and the pressure put on them to create heroes and villains. He also delves into the non-disclosure agreements, NDAs, regularly foisted on reality contestants to stop them spilling the secrets of their respective shows. At one point, he talks to the psychologist who assessed the contestants of The Contender, who has to speak in hypotheticals since he too is bound by an NDA. This penetrating and discomforting series is neatly summed up by Tim Wilson, that's me, former contestant on The Circle, who says, I'm a post-reality TV person. I have touched insanity. The BBC series, Unreal, a critical history of reality TV, presented by the journalist Pandora Sykes and Sirin Kale, offers a similarly damning assessment of the genre as it talks to creators, contestants and commentators and assesses its cultural impact. And uh, I'm not sure who, who, who is the author of this. The author of this is Fiona Sturges. So if Fiona Sturge happens to be looking, I would be very happy to follow up on this one. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, this, is a, um, this was an audible podcast that has been 10 years in the making. I did my interview about two years ago and the podcast only, only came online this summer. Uh, and I think part of that was because it it was bumping up against a a media cabal uh, that is determined that the truth will not get out about reality TV, that is determined that all the media will talk about and all the public will know is that some people can't deal with fame and some people are sore losers. And this is why I persisted in speaking about this. I don't wish to be too boring, um, but as I was one of the winners on the circle, I think my voice is important because I cannot be accused of sour grapes. I cannot be accused of saying I had a bad edit. I didn't. I had a really good edit and I really enjoyed being on the show. What I couldn't anticipate, what I couldn't know was just how overwhelmingly um, controlling uh, is this medium and are these production companies and all the sort of hangers-on that go with that. So I'm not suggesting the production company that made my show was necessarily tyrannical. 
um, but certainly some of the people who were delegated to um, uh, do things afterwards took their job perhaps a little too earnestly and were um, destructive rather than constructive and I wasn't the only person who felt that and uh, certainly I have also I, I, I've also spoken to people who felt suicidal and who were driven to abstraction by the nonsense that occurred after the show um, and I too have my own uh, run-in with that sort of nonsense when I looked for support when I looked for help and when I went to the people who were supposed to be delivering that help it wasn't available and uh, I was left waiting for 10 days before they finally said oh yes you do qualify by which point frankly I'd sorted myself out but I know of somebody else who rang up and that particular person was in a very bad state and uh, they equally said that, um, that they weren't available. I find that contemptible. The production company, of course, has apologised and has said this won't happen now that proper, um, uh, proper services are in place. But um, an apology in the end is rather cheap, isn't it? An apology is cheap. And what is needed, what is needed is not buckets of money or anything. What is needed is to get it right. And I believe the way to get it right is to delegate care to companies that are professional. To delegate uh, psychiatric care, if necessary, medical care, that should, be a, that should be a small area of care. The bigger area of care is the professional care, which is handed out to anybody else who is on television, to anybody else who is part of the entertainment industry. Uh, people who are giving their life and putting their life at risk for entertainment should be properly represented by equity and should be properly represented by management and agents. And if they aren't at the time when they are headhunted, this should be provided for them, or facilitated anyway. That's that's how it, how it boils down to in a, in a nutshell. Um, in fact, look, just up here, here. yes... Just up here, there we are. <laughs> this is this is one of the one, one of the ridiculous letters that I got from um, from Equity, um, and from a man called Paul W. Fleming, uh, who says um, this was his final letter. He says, uh, "Apologies, I've not been I've not been aware of any request to meet and discuss this further, and the correspondence." Um, was the first I, uh, I was aware of your queries and concerns. Nevertheless, the earlier correspondence I have answered, uh, I, I have answered the substantive questions raised, and although I recognise that you disagree with the union's position, this is the position on this basis, further correspondence will not yield a different outcome and is perhaps not a good use of our time. Equity doesn't really want to take this any further.